Exodus chapter number 34. We'll begin reading in verse number 33. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Referring to the Lord. So... Yes, I got sunburnt. I knew I was going to get sunburnt because I knew I was teaching this on about Wednesday of the middle of the week while we was on vacation. I didn't know I'm going to get sunburnt. But anyway, I was good until Wednesday. Didn't get sunburnt. And then I knew I was going to get sunburnt. Moses didn't get sunburnt. Moses' face shone because he got to so close to God that God started to rub off on Moses. He got so close to the presence of God's glory and power not just here, but several times. I mean, you can go back to when he went to the burning bush, right? And he's on the backside of the mountain, tended to his father-in-law sheep. When he came down from there, his face shone. Several times throughout Moses' lifetime, God's presence was so real that Moses just being around God, being faithful to write down what God had spoken to him so that he could go back and tell God's people what God had said, just getting that close to God's presence. It started to rub off on Moses' face. In fact, the reason that he had to wear a veil is because his face shone so brightly that the children of Israel couldn't stand to look at him. It hurt to look at Moses. That's how you know, bright Moses' face was shining. Okay, Take that, anybody that says that the sun shines of its own accord. Well... The sun will hurt your eyes if you stare at it. Well, yeah, so did Moses' face. Does that mean that Moses' face was the sun? No. God gave light to Moses' face just like God gave light to the sun, to the moon, to all the stars. God said, let there be light. And then one day God said to Moses' face, let there be light. It just started shining a little bit. But you'd find that little by little it'd start to wear off. That once Moses' face started shining, it's not that it kept shining. Right there are many gaps between the times that Moses' face shone so brightly that they had to put a veil on it. You say, well, when did it happen? Well, Moses got real close to God. In fact, you'll find in this verse, when he went out of the tabernacle, right? that's when he would put on the veil because that's where the children of Israel could see him. But when he'd go back into the tabernacle, he took it off because he wanted to get close to God. He didn't want there anything to be between him and God being the veil. You find that, you know, we've already said in the burning bush. Right? But every time that Moses' face shone, there wasn't anything between him and God. Okay, now, I mean, we can go back and look. We know Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household, but he was raised by his birth mother. God worked it out that his mother got to raise him in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In fact, not justifying what Moses did, Moses killed a man. But he killed a man because he was doing wrong to one of God's chosen people, one of his brethren. He fled from the face of Pharaoh, but he didn't flee from the face of God. Every time that God came down, Moses got closer to God. On the backside of that mountain when he was in the wilderness, when God said, come forth, he didn't let anything get between him and God. Right? He never said, well, hang on a minute. He never said, well, let me go do this first. He never said, well, what's going to happen about this, that, or this? He always drew closer to God. In fact, the Bible makes reference that when God would come down and speak with Moses, he spoke to him face to face as a man speaks to a friend. That means that in God's eyes, there was nothing in between God and Moses. Well, why didn't Moses' face shine? Because Moses realized there wasn't anything between him and God, and he wanted to get as close as he could get. But, if you study out the times that Moses' face started shining so bright that they had to put a veil on it, first off, you will find... Oh, I forgot to tell you all what we teach on. We teach on sunburnt Christians. Sunburnt Christians, that's what we're going to teach on. Okay? But if you study out Moses' face when it started to shine, first thing you'll notice, 
Moses didn't know when his face was starting to shine. He was oblivious to it. In his eyes, nothing had changed. He'd just gone in and talked with God, and he'd come out. People staring at him like, hey, can you put something over your face, man? It's a little hard to look at you, pay attention to you, because my eyes are about ready to burn out of my head. Moses couldn't tell. Now think about sunburn. For a little bit, you can start getting red, and you not know. But for me, that would have been about, oh, Wednesday, I think. Yeah, would have been Wednesday when we went to, went to Epcot. Didn't wear a hat that day. Should have wore a hat. Didn't wear a hat that day. This part of head, sunburnt, because didn't wear head. I mean, didn't wear a hat on head. That's what happened. We went to Hollywood Studios, wore a hat. I was good. Didn't wear a hat on Wednesday. But what happened? Got sunburnt. But before I felt that I was sunburnt, all of them started saying, ooh, you starting to get red. Well, guess what? I went and tried to sit in the shade, tried to avoid it. Didn't work. I thought, well, if I'm in the shade, I'm not going to get sunburnt. It's too late by then. Right? I had already soaked up too much of the sun, and it was starting to show. Well, what's the point we're trying to make? Moses couldn't tell, but other people already knew. You start drawing close to God, people are going to start seeing changes long before you ever you know, realize that, hey, God's really done something in my life. Right? That's the beauty of it. Draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to you. You don't have to get all the way over to where you think you need to get in order to start shining for God. All you've got to do is take one step towards God. God's taking one step towards you. Before you know it, you're already showing signs that you've been around God. That I don't know where the thought process came from that I've got to do this, 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 and this to be effective for God. No, throughout the whole Bible, God outlines that if you want to be an effective witness for God, if you want to be an effective teacher for God, if you want to be just an effective you know, ambassador of Christ here on earth, all you've got to do is be obedient unto God. Do what God said and God can use you. God's not looking for those that have crossed all the boxes or, you know, ticked all the marks. He's just looking for those that will do what God said to do. He rewards obedience. Right? And he punishes disobedience. That's it. You know why Moses' face shone? Because when God started talking to him out of the burning bush, he said, come in, take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. Everything God told Moses to do, he did. That's why his face started shining. You know why Moses' face started shining every time he'd go in to get some more of the law or the instruction that God would have for God's people? It's because he either recorded it as God said or he had pinned it down already on the tables of his heart and he had already purposed he's going out and he's going to tell them what God said. Even when they didn't want to do what God said, Moses was so serious about it, he said, well, who's on the Lord's side? Well, he came down off of the mount with the you know, Ten Commandments. He said, who's on God's side? And then they all said they was on He said, okay, you guys over here. And he said, Levites, we're killing the rest of them. That's how serious Moses was. He had already purposed that it's God's way or no way. So when God told him to come closer, he'd come closer. When God told him to go over there, he'd go over there. When God told him to tell Israel this, he'd tell Israel that. One time you'll find that Moses didn't do what God said. That's when he smote the rock when God told him not to smite the rock. And that cost him getting to see the promised land. God didn't tell him not to do it, but God didn't tell him to do it. If you're just obedient, God will bless you. You'll start shining. But see, here's the thing about sunburn too. Not only are other people going to see it before you know what's going on. Eventually, you're going to get to the point that you can feel it. You are aware of the fact that you are sunburned. Okay, more than just I was out in the sun. Okay, we've all gotten out there and gotten a little red, but not sunburned. But eventually, it's going to hit you that, hey, something's happening here. Could be while you're laying in bed at night, you're going to realize... Some parts of my body are a whole lot warmer than the rest of my body right now. It's about the top of my arms, right? It's on my forehead. It's got something to do with, you know, 
the outside of my legs, but not the inside of my legs. Something warmer. Now, the thing about sunburn is it's still working long after you've gotten out of the sunlight. You'll start feeling it. And then you know, oh, no. For me, I'm thinking, all right, one of these days I'm going to start peeling, right? I'm going to look like, you know, zombie or something walking around, just skin hanging off of me. All right, that's going to be great. I know I've got one more day at a theme park. Well, how in the world am I avoid it? I didn't wear a hat that day either. That was dumb. But mom wanted to wear red, white, and blue on Friday. I didn't have a red, white, and blue hat. So I couldn't have matched the hat to the rest of the outfit, so I didn't wear a hat. Probably got more sun on my head. Okay? Not smart, I know. Because I didn't put sunscreen on. Wasn't worried about it. I'm not hurting. It's not that bad. Not as bad as that time the Christian and I were on the cruise ship. That's, that's bad. I'm pretty sure I got sun poisoning that time. That wasn't good. Right? I'm not blistering up, but I knew. I was laying in the bed one night. I knew. Nope. I got sunburnt. Something that you can feel. But see, just because you got out of the sun doesn't mean that it stopped working. Moses came out, and that's when he put the veil on because he knew, well, if my face was shining before, it's only gotten brighter. He kept returning to the source, but he knew. Just because I'm not around it doesn't mean that it's not working. You get close to God just because you're not around the house of God, just because you're not reading the Word of God at that moment, just because you're not calling on the name of God at that particular moment, the things that God has put in you are still working. Right After I got sunburned, I could have stayed inside the rest of the trip. Guess what would have happened? Still would have hurt a little bit. Right, Eventually, skin still would have started to peel. Right, Nothing I could do. It's too late to stop what was about ready to happen. Okay, well, you get around the things that God... You don't have to be around it every second of every day for it to start doing the work in you. The more you're around it, the quicker it might happen. But God said that He made us a new creature when we got saved. So when we get around the things of God, we start drinking that everlasting water that's bubbling up in our souls. We start eating from the bread that Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Right? We start eating the bread that He left for us to eat. We start getting around singing that glorifies them. We start getting around teaching that edifies the saints. We start getting around preaching that'll, you know, step on our toes if we've been living in sin, but also encourage us to draw closer to God. We get around those things. You don't have to be around it all the time, but it's still working in you. You're still going to be able to feel it. You're on the job and people are cussing His name, but in your heart, you're singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Right? You get out and everybody's telling you how doom and gloom it is, but hey, one day, I mean, we sang about it in the song this morning, one of these days, He's going to call us up and it's all going to be over. Oh, happy day that day. Right? I mean, it's it. Well, I don't know how he's going to call. He could call us up one by. All I know is this is going to happen quick. He could call us in order. He could call us all at once. I know it's done in the twinkling of an eye. Not worried about it. Okay? Not once have, you know, anybody in the Bible said, well, I think he might not keep his word today. No, it's impossible for God to lie. Right? All the things that he's doing in you, he'll continue to do if you continue to be obedient. But nothing you can do to avoid it other than quench the Holy God in your life, but that's a very dangerous thing. Don't do that. God's been known to kill people for less. For grieving the Holy Ghost. Don't quench him. Right? But if you put it in, it's going to work. You don't have to be around it 100% all the time. Why? Because God lives in us. Through the person of the Holy Ghost. He sealed us. We're always around God. Why do you think God said that after we get saved, it's as if you know, He made us a priest to enter into the throne room of God to pray through? Because He's already in us. Of course it's as if He sees us right before Him in heaven. Right? Of course when the devil comes to be an accuser of the brethren, Jesus says, no, I'm in Him and He's in me. Well, how can He say it? Because He's in me and I'm in Him. I'm engraved in the palms of his hands, but yet he indwells my heart. He's sealed my spirit. Just because you're not around it or you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not making an impact on you. But, but eventually, 
Now, people notice it. Nobody told me to put a sack over my head because my head was so shiny. Right? But at some point, they did take note that uh, that doesn't look normal. I can't. I think it was my arm, somebody had said. Hey, you're getting a little red. I, I didn't notice because I don't walk around staring at my arms. Right? I walk around staring at stuff. They said, hey, something's not, something different here. Right? They knew that his face was shining. But they didn't know why his face was shining. The first time, they said, what in the world happened to you out there with them sheep? And then eventually they caught on. But it was something that was peculiar. You're not going to find people shining from being around the things of God out in the world. Oh, they'll, they'll shine with self. They'll shine with sin. They'll shine with you know promises of great and mighty things, but I all seem to always flicker out. There's a whole lot of things that claim to shine out there, but without God there is no light. You start getting around the things of God, you don't have to tell people, well, I've been going to church more. I've been reading my Bible more. I've been, you know, going to revival. This revival was a little bit different than some that we've had before. We didn't have to tell people something special was happening when all them revivals broke out last year. People knew that's different. Something done happened. What caused people to take note? But wasn't because we, well, we did something different. No. We just doing what we always done. But when he starts shining in us, people are going to notice. You don't have to tell them. They're going to be able to see it. You could have tried to cover it up, but it's, it's not just like really sunburnt. You get close to God, it's going to come out in the way you talk, the way you walk, the way that you react to things that used to may have offended you. But now, somebody tell you something, you can find a reason to praise it then. All right, well, you got to go back to the doctor again. Well, at least I'm not in the grave yet. Well, hey, you've got to go do this. You've got to go do that. Well, at least I still get to do it. Somebody's not doing it for me. That, all that being said, he shines out more than just your skin. Right? Back then, God worked in signs and wonders because that's what they used look for God had to give a sign that Moses had been close to God in order for Israel to believe that Moses was close to God but the New Testament makes it clear that the Hebrews sought after a sign but the Gentiles what they seek after wisdom God starts making an impact in you people are going to see it they're going to hear it they're going to be able to observe that you are different you may not notice that you've been different but other people are going to be able to tell that's not what my life looks like. That's not what my life gives me. That song that they've got in their soul, that hope that they have, that everlasting and blessed hope, I can't find that. That's different. Right? But then, after they noticed it, Moses had to become accountable for it. They asked him, well, hey, what is that? But then Moses had to give an answer for it. Moses, your face, well, I don't know why it's happening. All I know is I've been around God. But why is this happening? I don't know. Why is that happening? I don't know. All I know is I've decided to put God first. All I've decided is I'm going to follow after God. I'm going to instruct Israel with what God instructs Israel. I'm going to live my life the best that I can as thus saith the Lord for His honor and His glory. Because once again, what was the criteria? You just had to be obedient. But obedient and accountable are two different things. You can follow after God and never tell anybody. But let's be honest, if you're following after God and not telling nobody about God, you're not following after God. Because He instructed us to be a witness. Okay, but you can do everything that God wants you to do and never tell anybody 
people are going to notice. Somebody's going to stop you. Becoming accountable for it is owning the fact that, yes, I desire more God in my life. Many people become intimidated when talking about the things of God, and they never become accountable. Well, why do you do this? Oh, I just think that it's the best thing for me to do. They never get to the heart of the problem. Why do you do that? Because I love Jesus. Don't have to be combative about it. But Moses made no bones about the fact that, uh, yeah, I was in talking to God. I'm sure they had a few questions. Up until this point, I don't think I'd ever found an account where before God showed up in a burning bush on the backside of a mountain and started talking to somebody. Right? It was a peculiar thing. Well, why you? I don't know. But he loved me and I love him. But what's he want you to go do? What? Well, I got a little bit of it, but I don't know the other half. Right? Well, really, it was more than half. All he knew is that he wanted Moses to lead God's people out of Israel. Right? Didn't know that he was going to have to lead them in the wilderness for 40 years. Didn't know that he was going to have to beg God a few times not to kill him, even though Moses wanted to kill him too. Right? Didn't know all the headaches that come with it. Didn't know the burdens that would come with it. But he just said, I'm all in for what God wants. He became accountable. Right, but then, lastly, we've already alluded to it. If you get sunburnt, something's going to happen to your flesh. Your flesh don't like getting close to God. You know why your flesh doesn't like getting close to God? Because your flesh and God don't mix. They're at enmity with one another. Because the flesh was conceived in sin, it was you know, a sinner by trade, sinner by nature. Right? It didn't get saved when we got saved. Our soul got saved, not the flesh. We know this. Well, what's going to happen here in a few days? Hopefully it don't, but i got a feeling it will. What's going to happen here in a few days to all the spots on me that got sunburned? They're going to start flaking off and peeling off. Long before it flaked off, it died. That's what you feel when you get sunburned. It's the sun cooking the skin. Literally. The UV or the whatever it is, part of the sunlight that causes you to get red, what it does is it kills skin. The red is the inflammation from that. Well, what happens when it starts flaking? The part of you that was dead just starts falling off. You can try and put lotion on it, but it's still dead. Right, eventually, it's going to come off. You can put all the aloe vera that you want to on it it's still dead you can try and treat it but it's not alive it's dead well what revealed that what caused that to happen the sun well when you get around the things that got there are parts of you it may hurt because it's going to start dying off there's parts of this that don't line up with God and it either has to die off or I've got to get away from God. It's one or the other. That new creature, in order to grow, old man has to die. You start shining, there are going to be some things that start falling off of you. They're going to start flaking off in your life. Some of them, they may come off easy. Some of them may be a little bit harder to get rid of. Right? Some might hurt for longer. Some may not hurt hardly at all I can't tell you what it's going to be because each one of us got different things that we got to deal with right God made us all individually but then he saved us all individually but I also know that in him he was suffering or he suffered in all points like us that doesn't matter who you are Jesus overcame it so you can through him but the point is, it's not comfortable having those things start peeling off. It's not an enjoyable thing to say, hey Lord, uh, nuke the parts of me today that you don't like so that I can deal with the pain and they just fall off. Now, nobody says, Lord, put me closer into the fire today so that you can pull out more gold in me. 
It's not an enjoyable thing. It's not like, hey, sign me up for that. We're not masochist. But if you get closer to God, it's just going to happen in God's timing. That today, He may put you a little bit further in, but tomorrow He may pull you out, but that doesn't mean that the pain's going to go away. If the work's already been started until you yield to allowing it to happen, it's still going to hurt. I could have been in denial and sat out there in no shade. Right? Cooking away. Guess what I'd look like today? A whole bunch of boils. Right? I could have. Well, yeah, I'm not going to get sunburned. I already was sunburned. But staying out in the sun wasn't helping none. Right? Fighting against what God wants to do in my life isn't going to cause it to get over any quicker. Right? Going out and daring God, saying, Lord, I'm not going to give it up. I wouldn't do that if I were you. It's not a pleasant thing to fall under the chasing and rod of God. Right? Why does it hurt? Because something that's dead that God doesn't want in our life is trying to get out of our life. But if we hold on to it, if we try to take the part that God's trying to get rid of and keep patching it onto ourselves, we're going to look silly to everybody else. Can you imagine what would happen? But Brian, this would be dumb. I know that. Right? I don't plan on doing this. But if somebody who was sunburnt took all the parts that fell off and like put them on scotch tape and then tried to stick them back on, we'd throw that person in an insane asylum. But if we didn't and they walked around like that, nobody's hanging around with a leprosy dude. Right? He just got a whole bunch of dead skin taped to him. Nobody wants to hang out with that guy. Everybody's going to know whatever you're trying to be, you're not. Well, there are Christians that are trying to tape on things that they think God's happy with. Right? They're trying to piecemeal themselves into what they want to be. But everybody else can tell, that ain't normal. Right? There's something wrong there. You don't even have to get close... If I can see somebody coming up with a whole bunch of tape on them and dead skin, I'm not letting them in the building. I'm going and grabbing Mr. Deputy over there and saying, hey, find a reason to get rid of that guy. There's got to be a legal reason for that. Right? We might use COVID to get rid of somebody. I don't know what's causing that to happen, but I don't want it. Right? Well, how many people try to be what they want to be and they keep holding on to dead things? They've got them fastened to their life. God's trying to get rid of it. We're supposed to shed it. That new man is supposed to come forth. But we're trying to hold in the new man. Right? It'd be like in the movies when the Hulk gets all big and his clothes shred. It'd be like going up to him and trying to duct tape his shirt back on. It's not going to fit again. Even if it could fit, it's going to be taped on. Right? That thing basically exploded when the Hulk came out. Well, there are people walking around trying to tape things that either they want themselves to be or things that God says they don't need. They're trying to bolt them onto their life. They're trying to fasten them to themselves because, well, I want this. Well, if God don't want you to have it, you shouldn't want it. Because what we should want is to be what God wants us to be. But instead of accepting that it's no longer a part of them, they fight it. They fight it and they never grow. They're always stuck with that pain in the flesh of trying, God trying to say, hey, let it go. In the flesh saying, no, hold on to it. That, that's not a comfortable place to be. It's not comfortable getting to the point where your flesh is trying to resist and God's trying to implore you to let go. Right? That's that part where whatever God put in you, it's trying to get rid of the flesh, but you won't let the flesh go. You're just always suffering. Sometimes it shows up as bitterness. Sometimes it shows up as guile. Sometimes it shows up as anger. Sometimes it shows up with a lack of empathy. Sometimes it's apathy. Right? But that process of resisting what God wants you to do, it'll kill everything that God's trying to do, not only in your life, but in your family and in the church. Why do you think God said that it takes God to remove the root of bitterness? Because get way down in there, it's not something that I can handle. 
I tried to handle it and I made it worse. But if we get closer to God, He'll reach down and take out that root of bitterness. But you know what it takes? Allowing Him to complete the work in our flesh that He started. He made me a king to rule and reign over the flesh, but I can't change the flesh. I can't change the desires of my heart. I don't even know the desires of my heart, the Bible says. But it is evil. Why? Because it's cursed by sin. But you know who can change the desires of my spirit? God. Because He's the one that made my spirit alive. He's the one that gave me the desires of my spirit. You know who can strengthen my spirit? God. And you, does not the Bible say, He that's in you is greater than He that's in the world? So He can increase the strength of my spirit, and He can also give me the power to overcome the flesh through Him. Why do you think He said, I die, but Christ liveth in me? But holding on, trying to duct tape things that are falling off back to you, all that does is hinder what God wants you to do. And I mean, I was joking that, hey, somebody showed up like that, that'd be weird. I'd want to sit down and have a conversation with her. What's wrong with you? And why are you doing what you're doing? Right? That'd be, that, what's the, that, a red flag pop, pop up, you see that guy. Well, how many times, as Christians, we say, we identify that, well, yeah, I go to a Manu Baptist church. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yeah, you know, I go to church. But then we look like mummy boy over here trying to wrap dead things that aren't, you know, should be in the ground, should be dead, should have already handled it, but yet we're still clinging on to it. But hopefully I don't start, pe I'm probably going to start peeling. But you know what happens when I start peeling? I don't stop picking at it until it's gone. That's just the way that, that's the ADD in me, Okay. But what happens in a Christian's life when God says, hey, this right here shouldn't be a part of you? Ideally, we'd let God handle it. But you know what happens sometimes when you pick at it until it's gone? You're going to tear off some skin that's still alive. You know what happens then? It turns into a blister. It'll turn into a scab. Right? You do more harm. What it should do is just keep putting lotion on it and then it'll eventually take care of itself, right? But I can't do that because I'm Jordan and I've got a whole bunch of... If I see it, it's gone. Right? We can't be that way either spiritually. We try to rip something out of our life too quickly, we might miss something. We might do it the wrong way. We know that God wants us to let go, so we've let go of it. Well, let God remove it in time. Right? You ever see somebody say well I think that it's God's will for me to you know move here go there do this and instead of waiting on God's timing they launch out and next thing you know they've got a scab they didn't wait on God to do it and as a result they did harm to themselves might have done harm to other people right Moses finds out that God wants him on the back side of the mountain to lead God's people out of Egypt he didn't walk into Egypt and say, okay, everybody, uh, let's head on out. He knew that God had a plan. He waited on God's plan and then was obedient when God told him to go do whatever God's plan was. So we may be getting closer to God and we may want God to remove things in our life. It may not be necessarily you know, sinful things. But we, Lord, help me deal with this. Well, God may want you to deal with something else first. And you trying to deal with it may cause more harm to yourself. But it's one thing to have zeal. The Bible talks about it. It's another thing to be too zealous of a good thing. There are many that are zealous of good works, but how many of those people does God actually use to do something? Only those that are obedient to what God says to do. See, Moses, his face shone. He could have gone out and started... There are some things that 
God revealed to Moses, we find very early on, but God, God's people didn't know about that yet. What do you have to do? He had to reveal what God wanted him to reveal as God revealed it. He had to work on himself long before he could start working on what God wanted him to do. God may have given him a burden to do it, but there's something Moses didn't get to do. He didn't get to see the promised land because he disobeyed. The one time that we find that he disobeyed. But there was still a cost for it. All that Moses did right after didn't make up for that one disobeying, one moment of disobedience. So you better make sure when you do it, you do it right. God may want it gone, and that's great. God wanted to give God's people water, but Moses smote the rock, and he wasn't supposed to smite the rock. God had it all under control. Don't try and do it for God. Just let God do it in His timing. You get close to God, some things are going to fall, but just because I want it gone doesn't mean that God wants it gone. That thorn in my flesh may be to show me that God's grace is sufficient for me. And his strength is made perfect in weakness. Right? That trial in my life may be the very thing that God wants to use in order to reveal that I've been around God. But instead of allowing God to do and embracing what God's put in my life, I'm trying to rip it off and all I'm doing is hurting myself. I'm trying to run like Jonah from what God wants me to do to do what I want to do. All that's going to do is cause more pain. It's one thing to say, well, this used to be a part of me, and I still want it to be a part of me. It's very foolish to say, well, I want this thing that's never been a part of me, has nothing to do with me, and God hasn't said that it's supposed to be a part of me, but I want to attach that to myself. Now, that'd be like going down to a car lot and saying, I want this vehicle, but I don't know if I can have this vehicle, so I'm going to drag it around by a rope attached to my head until I find out whether or not it's supposed to be in my garage. But yet so many Christians do things like that. But I really don't know, but I'm hoping. Well, my hope is not in what I can get or what I can do. It's in who is. Him. You see, sunburnt Christians, they go out, people will take notice. But some people get sunburnt, and instead of showing off what God's done in them, they bring negative attention to what God wants to do. Some people get a little close to God, and then they decide that they're going to make themselves into what they want to be, and they can't ever get any closer to God. They get a little red, but they never start shining. Very few ever get close enough that when they come out, people say, hey, get away from us, you got too much God on you. You know who I find was like that? Well, Paul, for one, because God changed his name from Saul because people knew he wasn't Saul no more. Right, but those in the days of the early church where people started calling them Christians because they were like Christ, those that, well, hey, if we let them in here, they didn't even have to start teaching in cities, but yet they'd say, those guys are talking about Jesus. If they stick around, they're going to do a whole lot of damage to what we want to do around here. Right? How many people, when you walk into a building, say, hey, um, if you could, just don't talk about Jesus while you're here. Because that's how much God they had on them. God's no respecter of persons. Our face may not shine like Moses, but the light that's inside of us, Him, He'll shine really bright if we allow Him to. So how come people aren't shining? Because people don't want to get close enough. People don't want to let go when God says let go. People don't want to grab onto when God says grab onto. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His words forever settled in heaven. Everything that He's done hadn't changed, so what has the church? What has God's people? Very few people... Yet, and let's be honest, if somebody does 
get a touch from God. What happens most of the time? The people in the church try to kill it out so they don't have to deal with somebody that is close to God. They want to get, hey, we're comfortable here. Stop all that nonsense. Right? Run them down or run them out. Why? Because it makes them uncomfortable. They like where they are. Well, if God liked where you were, He wouldn't have had to save you. If God liked where you were, you wouldn't need a pastor. wouldn't need a Bible. You'd be able to sit at home and listen to Joel Osteen whenever you wanted to or felt like it because that would have been enough. Right? He could have written it in the sky. But no, He chose to put the greatest mystery of all time, why God would put Himself into earthen vessels. To cure what man did, which was sin, and bring forth a new creature so that that being could not only have everlasting fellowship, but He adopted us, birthed us into the family. One of these days we're getting married into the family. Right? God wants us to be so much a part of Him, He did it three different ways. That we could be a child of God. Well, how bad do we want to be a child of God? How badly do we want to bear in our bodies the march of the cross? To bear in our bodies the shame of knowing what my sins did to Christ, but then also the joy that He, taking away my sins, made me like Him to identify with Him and allow Him to be more like Him in me. He's going to be God. He can't help it. He is. But how much of God am I going to let out of what He's put down inside of me? At one point they let out so much that... I'll just use this example and then we'll be done. Paul and Barnabas, they went into Rome. They thought that they were two of the gods that they had come up with. They thought that Paul was Mercury or the messenger. If you know Greek mythology, that's uh, Hermes. With the little wings on his head and on his feet. They thought, well, Paul, sure, he talks with such power. He's got to be a god. Well, if he's talking all the time, he must be a messenger. He must be Hermes, right, or Mercury. And then they said, well, if he's talking, you know, and the other one's not talking, he must be telling the other one what to say. Well, he must be in charge. Well, who's in charge? Zeus or Jupiter. Right? Why? They had so much God on them that when people heard them talk, they knew that's not just somebody. Right? That's just not another guy. What he's talking about, that Jesus or whatever they're saying, it's got real meaning to it. There's something different about them. Now, I've never walked into a room and people said, you must be a god. No. I've never walked into a room where people, they literally tried to take them over to the temple and worship them. You think I'm nuts? Go read book Acts. But when they took it, they said, no, it's not about us. It's about him. They said, well, who's him? Jesus. He said, I am what I am because God, by His grace and His mercy, made me into it. But people took note when they showed up. Do people care when you come around? Everywhere that Paul went, I find God gave him an opportunity to witness. Right? How often do I get to do that? Because God would let me if I was prepared to. If I had a passion to, if I had a burden to, it's not enough just getting close. you got to let what God put in out. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.